Yeah, so we'll talk broadly about computational models that use this large omics data in the context of human disease of personalized medicine. And Rebecca already said that we are in the medical faculty. And I should say for um, openness that we also get funding from GSK and Sanofi, and I had fees from two small companies called Traver and Aztex. With that out of the way, as we were saying, so broadly speaking, in our group, we are interested in how we can use these different types of omics data in the context of human disease. And by omics, it can be measuring many proteins, proteomics, many metabolites, metabolomics, many um, RNA molecules, transcript, transcriptomics, and so forth. And these technologies allow us to measure, in the case of transcriptomic transcripts of all genes, around 20,000, in the sense of proteomics, maybe half of that, and, and so forth. So not necessarily a complete picture of the different molecules in the cell, but large numbers. And then we can measure these across samples. These samples can be from the laboratory, from um, cell lines or so forth, or from patients. And we can also measure this not only looking at uh, the, the human cells of the patients, but also in, in, in the look at the microbiome, our, our guest cells in our organisms. And furthermore, this type of data, uh, historically, we could measure it what's called in bulk. So if I get a sample from a patient, let's say the lung of a patient or a tumor, I measure the average proteome or the average transcriptome. But now we can also do this at the single cell level. Namely, from that sample, we can um, split up the cells and look at each individual cell, what's inside. And I think you can imagine that then the numbers explode. And then we need uh, computational methods to make sense of this. In our case, will the ultimate goal to use this to understand what's going on in disease and how we can find the right therapies to treat patients. And of course, we need computational methods, and in particular, uh, many people use statistics and machine learning to make sense out of this data, right? To find patterns in the data that maybe uh, we can just understand a disease or build more predictive models to, for example, try to estimate whether a therapy is going to work on a patient or not. Is that clear so far? Okay, so as an example, something we work in the past a lot is uh, using uh, cell lines. So cell lines growth in the, in the laboratory. This is with uh, Matthew Garnett and the Sanger in, when we were in, in ABI in Cambridge. So you take 1,000 different cell lines. These are samples coming from different tumors, from lung cancer, breast cancer, brain cancer, and so forth. Um, maybe 50 or so of each of these tumor types. Each of these cell lines is different, so you characterize with these different omics, like gene expression, transcriptomics, mutational data, and others. Now there is also proteome and so forth. And then also these cell lines, you treat them with drugs. So these are drugs, uh, either drugs used in the clinics, like chemotherapy or particular inhibitors, but also more experimental drugs. Uh, this is now 400 drugs, and also now there's a lot of data combining drugs. So you know for each cell line, how much drug you need to kill uh, half of the cells, like the IC50, by putting different amount of drugs and then looking at the survival of the cancer cells. And what you want to know is why some cell lines are have a high IC50, so they are resistant to the treatment. So this would be reflecting uh, when a drug doesn't work on a particular patient, and why in other cases the IC50 is very small. With a small amount of drug, you can kill the cell line, meaning you can stop the growth of, of a tumor. And so here you can then apply any machine learning method. And we and many others try different things from very simple linear models to more advanced Bayesian multitask learning. There are people who have some deep learning. And when you, when you just use these uh, methods, and I will just not get into the specific results, but what happens is that these models are able to predict the efficacy of drugs only with limited um, capacity. Perhaps in some contexts, like some drugs, it works a bit better than others, but in general, it's not that good. And also very importantly, it's very hard to understand why. So even when the model predicts from transcriptomic data whether a drug is going to kill a cancer cell or not, we don't know why mechanistically. And this is very important if we, we, we want to have trust on these approaches and want to take them further, let's say, uh, in the context of, of, of taking these insights into treating actual patients. So for this reason, uh, the emphasis of our group is how we can help these pure computational black box methods with biological knowledge. So there is a lot of things we know about these processes that happens in the cell, 
uh, like we know different pathways, different networks and, and how they work. So how we can use it uh, to help uh, the machine learning. Um, and, and the idea, as I will show you, is out of these large thousands of genes, we can extract uh, a smaller number of features. And these features, uh, because they are fewer, uh, increase the statistical power of our methods. So less input features, more power. Uh, and second, they are rooted in well understood biochemical processes or, or fairly understood, which means that they are more interpretable, but they're also more meanable for follow up analysis and so forth. And all, all the tools and, that I will show you that we do in the lab are free, and they are most of them R packages or Python packages. And we're always happy when people can use them. So the first thing is where do we get, so how, where do we get this biological knowledge? And uh, so there are many uh, good databases. Uh, there are also many good uh, resources that combine uh, different um, also databases, like uh, you may know also here from EMBL as, uh, from Borg Group, String or Stitch or others. So what we did is to focus on a second type of biological knowledge that is the one that is really highly curated, but um, maybe not so large. So the things that we know really well to bring them together under one portal. And for this, we developed this resource, which is called Omnipath, where we include information, uh, curated information uh, about which protein can activate which protein, how this happens, uh, complexes, annotations, uh, and also about localization. And, and really the emphasis in, is in keeping all the underlying annotations uh, which is now over 2 million coming from over 100 different databases. And, and this is a resource that is driven by our own research questions, but of course we make public available for scientists to use. And, uh, and the idea behind is that uh, there are many databases, many places where people have put together knowledge that we can use with different emphasis. Uh, maybe some people were focused on a particular type of biology like the immune system or cancer. Uh, other people uh, had a different emphasis. And so through Omnipath, you can plug and play different resources uh, in the same way that if you wear glasses, when you go to try your new glass, you try different lens and then you find the right one that allows you to see sharply. So in the same way with Omnipath, you can mix, mix and match or pick the right resource for your analysis. And uh, one thing that uh, I wanted also to mention is that uh, uh, we are now um, uh, trying to develop uh, kind of uh, a language that allow us not only to, to look at our resources that we have through Omnipath, but to share a common language with other domains of um, uh, biological knowledge. And this is part of, I mean, on the, on the technical end, uh, uh, refactoring of Omnipath using Neo4G. But what we hope it will allow us is that, uh, for example, there are great meta resources on, on the chemoinformatics world or, or on the role of, of mutation of variants in, in disease or Indra is a resource that does actually text mining. So the idea is that we can not only use the things that we have access to Omnipath, but combine with other types of knowledges. And if maybe if some of you are developing or are aware or are using some domain specific database that could be interesting to combine, let, let me know because we are now trying to expand this. Yeah. Okay, so that's a bit how we get the knowledge from. And now I will tell you a bit how we use this biological knowledge to extract the signatures from molecular data. And one thing that happens very often in molecular networks is that uh, what we want to measure is, what we want to know about is hard to measure. For example, it's very hard to measure at large scale the activity of kinases or of transcription factors of key molecular players. But these omics, well, they are telling us is what is the effect of these activities? So if, if, I'm, um, if I know how my interest feature, my process of interest affects those downstream omics, like the footprint, and this is what I get from the biological knowledge, these causal links, I can estimate the former from the latter. Now, by looking at changes in the downstream effect, I can see what's the activity of a particular process. So to be a bit more concrete, um, if I have transcriptomics, so changes in, in the expression of, of RNA molecules, I can use it to estimate the activity of, of signaling pathways. Not, so this is showing a cell, the receptors, the different pathways, 
and downstream the control by this would be transcription factors of, of gene expression. And there are tons of methods to look at pathways from transcriptomics, but most of them, they would look at what is the change on the expression on, on, on these blue components here, but these blue components are proteins. The signaling cascades are primarily built by proteins. So that there is more RNA doesn't mean that there is more protein. And even if there is more protein, doesn't mean that it's active. Because to be active, it maybe needs to go somewhere or needs to be phosphorylated and so on. So for this reason, we and also others instead look at the footprint. So which are the genes that we know change when a pathway is active? And by doing this, we get a much more accurate uh, estimation of its activity. So the same thing I can do to look at transcription factors, and it's very analogous. So again, whether the RNA of a transcription factor is higher or lower only roughly correlates with its activity. But we know for many transcription factors with reasonable quality, what are the target genes? So then this is the so-called regulant, so we can use this to estimate the transcription factors. The same can go to other type of omics. So if I have phosphoproteomic, the phosphorylation is driven by the activity of kinases. So if I know which phosphorylation sites are controlled by which kinases, I can use phosphoproteomic to estimate the activity of kinases. It will be here in green. And for metabolomics, I can do something similar. So metabol lights are controlled by metabolic enzymes. It's a bit more complicated, but in essence, it's the same idea that by looking at the changes in, in metabolites, I can estimate uh, the, the activity of metabolic enzymes. Anyone is still with me? Still okay? Okay, good. So once we have these features, then what we try to do is to integrate them in the network. No? So here we depicted a, a network of, of how different proteins interact. So what we try is then to connect them. And for this, we, we develop a framework called uh, Cosmos, which is, tries to find causal links connecting different uh, processes uh, molecularly. <clears throat> and I will tell you a bit about this using a study we did recently. So in this case, we're looking at kidney cancer. So with colleagues in, in Aachen, Raphael Kraman, Christian Fretza in Cambridge, who's actually now in Cologne, and Jesper Olsen in Copenhagen. So in Aachen, they got these kidney samples. And then uh, our colleagues is the transcriptomic, the phosphoproteomic, and the metabolomic <clears throat> using mass spec and RNA-seq. Then as a first step, just what I told you until now, from each of these omics, we can estimate the activity of particular uh, key players, transcription factors, kinases and metabolic enzymes. And then <clears throat> with this method Cosmos, what it does is to map this on a large network, I will show you in a moment, and then trying to find which causal links in these networks can explain what I see. So can I find a pathway that explain why when a kinesis is going up here, a transcription factor here is going down and maybe a metabolic enzyme here is going up. And, and this is example is a schematic, so it's trivial. We can do it by hand, but to do it in large networks, we, we develop a method based actually in um, integer linear programming to find an optimal network. Because indeed the networks can get quite complicated. So this is just a hairball to illustrate how large it is, the, the starting network that we use that comes from Omnipath also. Uh, stitch uh, from EMBL to look at uh, protein metabolites binding and recon 3D, a large metabolic network. So you have this network, it's not much you can learn from it. Now you can map on it, this kinesis, transcription factors and metabolic levels and find the key paths that connect them. So then you get the network, the network on the right, still is a bit complicated, but certainly less so than the one on the left. Uh, and then here we can really go deeper and find um, specific paths that connect uh, important players. And as, as here, you know, why a particular kinase, how based on what we know of the network, how this could be driving changes in a particular metabolite, and this in turn affect uh, a transcription factor. And, and these are um, some of these findings, uh, we, when we look further, we saw that they were known things in the literature. Some others are new hypotheses. And one thing that I want to emphasize is all these methods are really hypothesis generation tools that you should follow up. So in making this analysis and these models, we are also doing assumptions. We know the data is not perfect. We know the networks are not perfect. So the way to see them is a way to distill from large, large data sets, a specific hypothesis that 
for example, it can be validated in, in a follow-up experiment. But just to summarize this part, so <clears throat> uh, I tried to explain to you how we use the omics data as an indirect uh, measurement, as a footprint of key molecular processes. Uh, and then later, how we can bring them together into large networks using these cosmos methods to find uh, mechanisms and, and potential causal paths uh, connecting processes across signaling, gene regulation, and metabolism. OK, so far, so good. Any question? Yes. You mentioned this problem that is just, you know, that basically just prediction. So how do you give information about the reliability of the speed or confidence? Of the, for example, of interactions or yeah. of the data? Yeah, you can weight them. So in the, in the optimization, you can weight uh, every component, uh, basically give a different penalty. Like, mm -hmm. I choose so this. Yeah, you will see the one, one number score or where you see a different sort of score? Or how do you tell the user that? So you, you would, uh, at the end, uh, summarize into one score that you try to optimize to find the model. And in this score, uh, you include how well you explain the different data, but also some uh, Occam's razor, some parsimony to have simpler models. Um, and, and then that's what you use. But what also happens is that there is typically many solutions that can be equally good according to your metric. And then, of course, you should report them all and say, OK, it could go this way or that way, and in both cases, I could explain the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have Sorry, I understand well the question. Could you repeat? Yeah. I was going to say it too. Yeah, so, yeah, good point. <laughs> If you have a mutation that affects ah. all the interaction, the downstream interaction, um, can you identify this different path if it's not already defined in some uh, in some other with some other method? I don't know. Yeah. Or, okay. It's a very good question. So, first mutations. If you know the effect, you can include them in the network. You can say, okay, I know this kinase activity is disrupted, so in my network I can remove its activity because it's not happening. Uh, if you don't know it, uh, you can try to, I mean, we haven't done this really, but I think, yes, you could try to um, identify effects. Uh, also because one thing that these methods often allow you to see is data that you cannot explain. So if you would see, you know, this, I, this doesn't make sense, then it could also point you that there is something strange going on, like a mutation is changing something. So we didn't do this systematically, but I, I think such a framework can allow you to contextualize the effect of mutations, but also uh, estimate what could be the effect of a mutation given that you see something different to what you would expect. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, so the next thing that we did, and that's what we work mostly now, uh, but um, it depends on the interest, we can go deeper or not is whether we can take these methods for bulk into single cell. And I told you at the beginning, uh, now there is um, a lot of technologies that allow us to look at RNA or proteins, uh, individual cells in a sample. And uh, the, the first thing that, that we ask ourselves is if, if we can use these footprint methods in the context of single cell, because what happens when you measure single cells is that you don't get so many measurements. So, if you do transcriptomics in bulk, you get 20,000 genes measured. If you do single cell for each cell, maybe you get a few thousands or even less. And technically, anyway, we did some benchmarks to show that this still um, uh, works. And then this means that we can then take a, a complex sample of a tissue and characterize at the pathway or transcription factor level all the cells or all these groups of cells. Anyone here works with single cell data? Probably not. So I will not get too much deeper into detail. But anyway, this is just an example of how you can apply these methods to look at subpopulations of cells and, and find specific pathways and did this guide some follow-up experiment, but uh, uh, um, it's not so important. But one thing that uh, is quite in interesting for us uh, is that when um, first, I mean, when you have single cell, you can look at 
subgroups of cells, so-called cell types. So imagine if you measure a sample from, from a tissue of, of a patient, you, you will see there is, um, maybe if it's skin, uh, some epithelial cells, you also will have immune cells, you have many different types of cells. And what now you can do is to analyze the different cell types in that sample. So in each cell type, you can look at the things I saw you before, like pathways, transcription factors, but also there are ways to understand how cells talk to each other. So you can use the single cell data to, to study communication as an approximation. Uh, and the idea is very rough. So you will say, okay, I, again, from prior knowledge, so in our case from Omnipath, I know which ligand can bind to which receptor in, 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 in general. Uh, and then I look in cell type A, if the ligand is very express or highly express, and if another cell type, the cognate receptor is highly expressed. And if they're both highly expressed, it is very likely that these cells are communicating because one is shooting out the ligands, the other one has the corresponding receptor. And this is very broadly used in the context of single cell. And because we were not sure which method to use and um, how well they work, we put quite a lot of effort in bringing together many different methods for doing this different databases, and we did some benchmarks. I will not go into the detail, but what we found is that um, in general, these methods give you different results, and also that um, they all get some signal, but um, it's far from perfect. And I just want to make this point that the same way I told you before, when, when you look at signaling pathway, people look at the expression of the components and they say, okay, if the expression is higher, the protein is higher and the protein is more active. So in the context of cell-cell communication, there are also many assumptions. And uh, in, in this case, if you think uh, biologically, what happens if two cells are communicating is one, let's say sender cell has to express the corresponding legal. This has to be, of course, this RNA has to be translated into the peptide or protein, has to be secreted, it has to diffuse to the media. It has to reach the target cell, and then it has to uh, elicit a response. And uh, there are many steps that are in between that are assumed to not to be so critical or, or, or that it's enough to look at the first step here and kind of the, the, the last step here for what's happening in between. And in this case, I think this is uh, clear, but in, in many cases when people does analysis of omics data or in bioinformatics, we all do a lot of these assumptions. And maybe as a word of caution, if you use any of these methods, think hard, try to understand all the assumptions, biological assumptions behind the method, because this will propagate and is the point I also said before, that most of these methods only give you hypotheses that you need to really validate. And, and part of the problem is to know if methods work, is if it's hard to have ground truth. It's hard to have a condition where you really know what's happening. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to understand, uh, you know, how can we know in a system if two cells are truly talking, are truly communicating, and we also have RNA seq from both cells so that we can prove or check if the methods are really capturing whether cells are talking or not. And this is very hard to, to get such data. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the last thing that is very exciting in the field, and I will only touch it, but I can tell you more if you're interested, is that so I told you now we can measure single cells, but what you would do is you take a tissue, you will separate the cells and look molecularly every one of them. But even newer technologies allow you to do this without having to lose the information of which, where was each cell in the tissue, right? So if you separate the cells and you see, and you analyze them, okay, this cell has this up or that down, but it matters who was the neighbor, no? So the, how were these cells working together? So now there are technologies that also allow you to look at the what's happening in specific places in a tissue. And uh, we have worked a lot on this. Uh, um, we have a project which is also part of uh, Informatics for Life, where we try to use it to understand uh, when, when there is infection in the heart, so the heart adapts. This, this is called remodeling and involves uh, inflammation and fibrosis. And we're interested in trying to understand how, how this happens molecularly, because of course it underlies a lot of deaths in, in, in our society. And what we did is 
to use one of these technologies that give us a special resolution. It's called spatial transcriptomics, combined with other technologies that look at the dissociated cells. And I will I will just not get into the details. Um, um, but anyway, this was work work also with colleagues in, in Aachen and Biden Hoss and Rafael Kraman, and Ivan Costa and Hendrik Milting, where we look at different samples from people with an infarction, healthy ones, and, and people with chronic heart failure. And what we were what we were planning or what we were aim to do is to combine different uh, these three different molecular data uh, to understand what's regulated in infarction, both intra and intercellularly. And for this, we use the tools that I, I, I showed you before, uh, the biological knowledge to try to better understand uh, what's um, uh, happening on, on, on the different places. So for example, we can look at activity of pathways or of transcription factors now like as maps, like with a special resolution. So not only what's in each individual cell, but what's activity in particular places in, in a certain tissue sample. And also we can use the information about uh, the localization to try to extract effects of interactions. So does one cell or one place in my tissue depend on the neighboring cells and what can this mean? <clears throat> and for this, we develop a method called MISTI to just allow us to, to extract this information. So basically, if I have a tissue and I have a place, how much of what happens in that place depends on itself, what's called intrinsic view, how much depends on the direct neighbors, what we call the juxta view, or more distant neighbors, what's called the para view. And this is a machine learning model with a multi-view system, so you can try to look at these different aspects. So this part I'm going fast because since none of you works on single cell or transcriptomic data, just to give you a, a flavor of uh, what can be done. Uh, but now I, I want to go back to in the last part to, to the question of, of, of uh, you, computational models to predict the um, drug response. And in my beginning of the talk, I told you how we, there is this large data sets where, where you have um, um, omics data on one side and drug response in the other, and you can throw machine learning methods in between and try to predict drug response. And I told you that uh, our idea is that by using biological knowledge and all these features that I showed you before, we can help the algorithm. So when we did this and other group did this, uh, what we found is that these mechanistic signatures indeed improve the predictability, but it still is like far from perfect. There is a large room for improvement. Uh, and, and to really understand better this problem and how you can best predict drug response from molecular data, uh, we leverage this uh, dream that also Rebecca mentioned in the introduction, which is a way to involve the, the global scientific community to find solutions to important computational problems. So any one of you knows about crowdsourcing? Some a bit. So, I mean, there are many flavors of crowdsourcing. It's different ways to bring together people to solve a problem. And the, the variant that we use is to do a challenge. Um, so the, the idea of a challenge is that there is a problem that you want to know how to best solve it. And of course you can try to solve it yourself like we do in our own research, but you want to see if other people can come up with better methods. So let's say uh, the question of, can I predict the efficacy of a drug from molecular data? So what you do is then you, you make public uh, some data that people can use to build algorithms and you withhold some test data. Uh, and this allows you to uh, assess um, the methods in a biased manner because the one who has the answer is not the one who develops the method. And if you enforce that people must submit their methods, you improve reproducibility. Uh, and, and this can be done also if, if you want to use some on data from, for example, the sensitive from patients by, by using containers. Uh, and then you can bring together uh, information or of many methods called the wisdom of the crowds. And, and this has been applied in many contexts. So in the field of uh, protein structures, uh, there was this CASP initiative for many years. Uh, and then uh, DeepMind came along and, and gave it a big uh, boost, as you probably know if you work on that field. So, so it's the same idea as CASP if you are from that field. 
Uh, and, and what is useful also is that by, by bringing many methods, you can gather what's called the wisdom of the crowds. That I don't know if you know what this is, uh, but so the idea of the wisdom of the crowds goes a long way back to Galton, so who's one of the fathers of modern statistics, and he also was wondering himself about um, uh, how crowds work and also, you know, how even in the context of the value of, of voting and, and, and so forth. And, and then he went to a market in, in Plymouth in, in England where the farmers used to have like a game. So there was like uh, an oaks and then the farmers will try to guess the weight of the oaks and the one uh, who was the closest would win, win, win the prize. So what Galton did is to ask the 800 farmers what, it, what they thought was the weight and compute the median. And then it turned out the median was almost exactly the, the weight. So even though maybe no single farmer was right on by bringing together you, you get uh, a better prediction. And this is called the wisdom of the crowds. It's also used in machine learning. Like if you think of ensemble models that you're kind of doing that as well. So trying to compensate the bias of, of different methods. <clears throat> so this idea is something that you can leverage in these crowdsourcing efforts because you are bringing many methods for many people. And then you can do like average models of all the methods. And this is typically better than any single method. So in, in the context of DREAM, we have applied this uh, in many contexts of problems of um, uh, molecular systems related to the things I, I told you before, like gene regulation, like transcription factors or signaling pathways or other type of, of biological networks or even the looking at uh, samples in tissues. And also we have looked at the context of drug response, not the problem that uh, I've been discussing earlier on. Can you predict drug response from molecular data? And so the way you would do that in that context is you will say, okay, I have from some cell lines, I have information on the molecular level. I have information of how some drugs affect these cell lines. As I said before, you keep some data, the test data, and then you make public the training data. So uh, people have, let's say three months to build algorithms and then to provide the answer for this data and then you can score them. No, in, in, in this case, this was a few years back now, but we had 44 different teams and then we could score them using some metrics. Uh, and, and the point I want to make in the context of drug response is that here below, you can see each column is each of the methods and, and uh, each of the participants and they are grouped by the type of algorithm they use, like from random forest or super beta machines. And then you could, uh, score them and, and according to this metric, a random prediction, so just trying to guess would be this line uh, uh, and, and a perfect, which will be one is kind of out of scale up here, no? So what this uh, figure tell us is that even though most methods got some signal, so this is better than random, again, there is still a lot of room for improvement. So the same thing that we found over our research and also here we found that teams that would use biological knowledge pathways and so forth will do better than those that didn't. So, uh, so wh why is it so hard to predict this drug response? No? So uh, I saw you our own research, how far we got. Then we also try to ask the community how to solve this problem. And um, I don't know, anyone has any idea why is it so hard to predict the drug response? Yeah. So variability across the individuals or, or, or the drugs. Or the single individual. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Not every day it's the same. Mm -hmm. Any other idea? Yeah. Sure. And especially not every cell is the same. So yeah, I think. Yeah. Also, uh, the best thing will to another, you know, place of the interaction you know, yeah. network. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And? Yeah. 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 Um, I guess drug side effects uh, and uh, having the right 
output, and all of these are good arguments. I normally have a list to show that includes those, um, uh, but there is one more uh, that we think it's maybe a bit underappreciated, and 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 this is very nicely summarized in a, in a review a few years back from Tony Latai, an oncologist in Boston, then of Harvard. And he says, consider trying to predict what happens if you poke a dog with a stick, by analogy with hitting a cancer cell with a drug. So the analogy would be then you, you kill the dog, you look at all its omics molecularly, you measure all these terabytes of data, and then you try to use this to make the prediction. But then he says, okay, there is the other way, which is hit the dog with the stick and see what happens. And what is meant by this is, so we are trying to predict how cells respond to a perturbation from basal data, right? All these molecular measurements are done <clears throat> in kind of static steady state, and it's hard to predict from a static measurement how it will respond to a perturbation. Uh, and <clears throat> for this reason, we and others also <clears throat> used uh, uh, kind of other type of approaches to look at this problem. So besides throwing a lot of big um, large data sets into machine learning, we try to be more detailed mechanistic models that try to explain the dynamics of these systems. So how they evolve over time when they are perturbed. And for this, we, we used logic models. So we tried to simulate what happens in cellular systems by analogy with um, what happens in kind of in a, an electrical circuit. So you have uh, nodes and edges which are connected by logic gates. Uh, and this is very simple, of course, biochemistry is much more complex, but this allows us to scale it up to large networks. And also we can use different, different formalisms and we can even convert them into differential equations. So this allows us to take data. So you have a focus system, you perturb with different ways. You use prior knowledge to build a model and then you train the model to the data and then you can construct dynamic models. Dynamic models that you can simulate, that you can use to predict the effect of new perturbations and think how, happens, how things happen over time. You can use different types of molecular data, it doesn't matter so much. <clears throat> but then we have used these models to go back to this question of how you can better predict drug response. And <clears throat> uh, so the way you would go about this is, uh, of course, these models are much more detailed and more laborious, and they also need this perturbation data. So you cannot do them for all potential drugs and cell lines, but you can go deeper and, and in, in particular cases where you are really bad in predicting in a pure machine learning manner, you can try to go deeper, do dedicated experiments with perturbations with drugs and extracellular ligands across different cell lines, and measure <clears throat> if you can the activity of proteins with phosphoproteomics. And then by doing this for each of the cell lines, you can train a generic network of, of the cell to data of each of the cell lines, and at the end build cell line specific models. And we have done this in the past in, in, in different contexts, and we have shown that these models allow us to, to, <clears throat> to better predict um, a drug response and to really identify mechanisms that you will not find by purely looking at, um, at, at the basal data. <clears throat> so if I don't lose my voice in the next five minutes, uh, I will just show you the, the latest things we are doing around this, which is, it goes about the question of how we can translate these ideas of models to patients. <clears throat> And the, the reason is that this type of experiments, like the ones I saw you here, are laborious and you need a lot of material because you need to take cells in different conditions, per turf and measure. So yes, you can do in the laboratory, but uh, at the end of the day, what you want to model and what you want to predict is if a drug is going to work on a patient. And in patients, it's much harder, of course, to get material. So one context where this is still possible is if you look at blood, because blood, you can get more amount, so for example, in, in a study we did recently, we look at multiple sclerosis patients, the blood, who can study the immune cells. And it's always this idea of taking the sample per turf with ligands and drugs. Uh, in our case, around 150 donors, build for each donor a model and use these models to simulate and to predict potential combination therapies. And just to give you an example, so this is what such a model looks like. So you have all these kinases and proteins covering different aspects of biology. And using this model, we come up with a combination therapy. So two drugs that together were more effective. Uh, and then going back to a mouse model, we could validate this. This is just to show that the validation work. 
but if you don't look at the blood, if you look at solid tissues, is you don't get so much material. So for this, what we did is to work together with uh, Christoph Merten, who was at EMBL, he's now at EPFL in Lausanne, and the clinician Sinachen, Torsten Kram and Ulf Neumann, to use microfluidics to do mini experiments. So the idea is that you encapsulate in a very small droplet, a few cells with a drug and a barcode. So you want to know what you put in each of these little droplets. So it's like mini experiments. And because they're so small, you need first very small amount of material per experiment. And second, <clears throat> you, you, you can automatize it no? with these microfluidics and robots. This is done su super fast and uh, relatively easily. And <clears throat> so we did this uh, um, as a case, uh, proof of concept using uh, pancreatic tumor biopsies. So in that from patient biopsy, you can do drug screenings and then you can use them to, to, to look at the effect of different drugs and which one induce apoptosis or which one kills the tumors. And then also we use the same dynamic models, the logic models I told you before to take this data and, and to build uh, for each of the patients a dynamic model and again, use the model to predict drug combinations uh, uh, that we could not validate in the patients, but we could validate in cell lines or in mouse models. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I went a bit fast in this last part, but if you want, we can talk more about dynamic modeling, but I just wanted to show you this other part of the work in the lab. And first, uh, uh, thank the, the people uh, in, in our lab. So uh, from what I saw you, this Omnipath, this all knowledge is mostly driven by Dennis today. Uh, Aurelian did this multi-ohm integration with Cosmos. Martin did the example in the multiple sclerosis. Federica, the one, the last ones with the microfluidics. And Giovanna and Ricardo do a lot of the spatial work. Uh, we have a lot of great collaborators. I mentioned them along the way. Um, and our funders, we are always looking for talented students and postdocs, if you like this type of things, or you have friends who are looking for positions. And I'll just in the last minute, I'll try to summarize, but uh, uh, I hope I, I, I managed to, to, to explain you today. So first, <clears throat> so machine learning uh, is, is, is a very powerful toolbox that can be applied in the context of personalized medicine to analyze all this large omics data. But I think there still is a lot of work to be done. And we think that in this context, it's very helpful to use this biological knowledge to, to help the machine learning. Uh, in particular, I explained this idea of, of the footprint, so how um, uh, specific uh, changes downstream can tell you about what's happened in your key process of interest more upstream. I very briefly mentioned that in the field of single cell and spatial technologies, there are new opportunities for this type of approaches, but there are also challenges. And, and at the end, how we think there is value in combining this machine learning with more dynamic models, with uh, models that capture how system over time evolves under perturbations and, and so on. And in summary, what we do in, the, in, in our group is to take biological knowledge from databases. This knowledge is typically generic. So you don't know how much of that is relevant for your liver, your kidney, cancer, or whatnot. But then by training it to data that is more specific to a particular organ, a particular disease context, we can make these patient specific models. And then these models, we use them to understand what's going on, get mechanistic insight into disease, and also to predict the effect of new therapies. And with that, yeah, I'm uh, happy to take any questions and thank you for listening.